Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the art of balancing curricular choice in upper secondary education. I'm Sasha Ramirez. I'm the OECD Education Communications Manager. Now, it's been a long time since I was in upper secondary education, I admit, but I do remember that some of the core I got to choose, like business administration or music. And I remember some of the ones that I hated the most that were the most difficult, and I'm thinking about calculus that I still have nightmares about, were the ones that really, you know, without which I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have been able to make all the choices in, in further education that I was able to make. I wouldn't be able to get some of the jobs that I've had. So there's an importance there as well. So that's what we're here to talk about today. You know, is there such a thing as too much choice in upper secondary education choice of subjects? Is there such thing as too little choice? Now, I don't have the answers to these questions, but I'm pleased to welcome our very distinguished panel who can help me talk about these things. Ihor Krovostani is the General Director of the School Education Directorate of the Ministry of Education and Science from Ukraine. Welcome, Ihor. Stella Pearson is the Deputy Director of Advanced British Standard. Welcome, Stella. Adeline Croyer is the Deputy Director of Upper Secondary Schools and Vocational Training at the General Directorate for Schools within the Public Instruction and Educational Action Service of France. Friedrich Carlson is a senior advisor in the National Commission of Inquiry on Upper Secondary and Vocational Education. And finally, Camilla Stranati is a junior analyst in the Transitions and Upper Secondary Education team. I hope I won't have to say those full titles again because that's a bit complicated for me, but welcome everyone. I'm delighted to have you with us here today. Now, before we start, you know, this webinar comes at a very important moment for Ukraine. Despite continuing to heroically fight against Russia's continued war of aggression, the country has made some really significant reforms in terms of its education system. In fact, they recently added an additional year to their education system, and they're now looking at ways that they can make they increase the choice for their young people in the country so that those young people can then go on to lead the reconstruction and the reform of that country. So why don't we start with Eeyore, who is going to walk us through some of those reforms, talk us through how that's looking for his country, and talk about what those challenges look like and some of the challenges that they're facing. Uh, and just a reminder before we start, uh, please send any questions or comments that you have for our panelists into the chat, and we'll be ha happy to get to them uh, when we have time. Thank you very much. Eeyore, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to today to speak about the key reform of the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine, uh, which is called the New Ukrainian School Reform. Uh, and it, it started uh, in 2017. And in 2027, we'll have this reform in upper secondary education. So the reform will be launched uh, specifically uh, in um, a sphere we are talking about today. We, by the reform, we aim to introduce a more flexible and personalized learning experience for students, particularly through the implementation of subject choice. As of now, uh, students face an overwhelming number of subjects and information, much of which is frankly not applicable in real life. Uh, a focus on relevant and interesting for student subjects is proposed. This innovation is part of a broader effort to align, align education with the evolving demands of technology-driven world and prepare student, students for future challenges. So the vision of the ministry in Ukraine is the following. Starting from grade 10, students can explore different subjects before focusing uh, more deeply in grades 11 and 12. Uh, by the way, uh, the reform um, launched the idea of 12 grades uh, education because we used to have uh, 11 years of um, secondary education in Ukraine. The system is structured around profiles, uh, so-called profiles that require a certain compulsory subject supplemented by a set of subjects related to uh, the chosen profile and additional free choices, like uh, Sasha mentioned, uh, art or music or something like that. Uh, this approach aims to balance deep specialization with the flexibility to explore uh, diverse areas, fostering both academic and personal development. 
Uh, of course, the transition faces significant challenges. I uh, can list uh, a few of them. Uh, the first one is developing a, a diverse and adaptable curriculum that accommodates both compulsory and elective subjects and offers simultaneously both depths and breadth. Uh, the second one is ensuring that students from all backgrounds and regions uh, of Ukraine have equal access to diverse educational opportunities, prevented any form of uh, educational uh, inequality. Thirdly, designing a fair and efficient network of schools to ensure equal access to quality education for, education for all students. Uh, one more is teacher training system to adapt to a more flexible curriculum and effectively deliver a new content in education. And the last, but I'd rather say not the least, assessing not only traditional academic knowledge, because the reform uh, itself aims to make a shift from knowledge-based uh, education and approaches to competence-based um, approaches. But uh, so simultaneously developing soft skills like critical thinking, so-called soft skills, collaboration, emotional intelligence, that is developing new assessment tools and criteria that accurately measure these diverse competencies. So all in all, um, we have quite an ambitious um, goals and ideas, and I, I am happy to uh, discuss them. And uh, I am very glad to, to hear about another different systems of education and to have some insights for Ukraine as well. Thank you so much. On mute, Sasha. On mute. It's still muted, Sasha. Uh, on Zoom. There. Thanks, Ior. Sorry about that. Uh, some technical issues, of course, at my end. Uh, no, thanks so much. It's really fascinating to hear about uh, the, the work that your country's been doing, those reforms. Uh, and before we go to Camilla, who will introduce the report, I just wanted to quickly ask, you know, what is, uh, how has Ukraine been working with other countries to uh, either get inspiration or insights or, or, or discuss some of the reforms that other similar countries may have gone through in that context? What has what the role of, uh, you know, peer learning and those kind of things been, been for you? Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to mention, of course, OECD here, because we had a great seminar and great conference, I'd rather say, today, conference of Ukraine in Ukraine. Uh, and Andreas Schleicher also took part uh, physically uh, in, in this conference, and it, it, it was just a great uh, experience for us, and also we have plans to collaborate with different systems, uh, educational systems. And uh, I believe it, it, this synergy in the efforts will bring a great result here. Wonderful, thanks so much. Uh, great, uh, Camilla, maybe you could walk us through um, the recent OECD publication that's, uh, well, uh, uh, just, just coming out um, uh, and talk us, about, uh, talk us through what, uh, what that looks like and what are some of the kind of key findings there. Thank you, Sasha. Can can you see my screen? I'm just going in presenter mode. Looks very good. It? Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. So as Sasha just mentioned, I'm Camilla. I'm from the OECD team. And today I will present the new spotlight that was published just this morning on managing choice, coherence, and specialization in upper secondary education. The spotlight is a shorter version of a very long working paper we published last April. And we decided to have a shorter version to make it more accessible. So let's start by looking at different upper secondary systems. In the, um, in the figure, you can see OECD countries plus Ukraine. The darker gray bar represents upper secondary. And on the vertical axis, you can see the theoretical age of students enrolled in education. So just at a first glance, we can clearly see that upper secondary looks very different compared uh, across countries. Uh, it looks different in terms of starting age. Usually students start at 15, but it ranges between 14 and 17. Sometimes upper secondary is, uh, the full cycle is compulsory, sometimes only part of it, and sometimes it's not compulsory at all. 
The duration might also vary, usually three years, but it can range uh, from two to five. And finally, of course, also the age of completion might change. It's usually 18, but in some countries they finish a bit earlier or a bit later. So today we'll have a discussion and speakers from different countries and systems. So let's take a look together at their upper secondary systems. For example, in France, students uh, start upper secondary at 15 and they complete at 18, but only the first year of upper secondary is compulsory. While in Sweden, they have a similar duration. They start one year later and complete one year later compared to France, but the full cycle is not compulsory. And then uh, in England, the United Kingdom, upper secondary is four years. The, the full cycle is compulsory. But England is a bit of a special case. As you can see, I circled the last two years because in England, upper secondary is divided in two stages. The first stage from 14 to 16 is more structured. And usually students are required to study um, a certain number of subjects. And there are a lot of compulsory subjects as well. When the second phase, what they call the post-16 phase, there is more flexibility and students uh, have more freedom uh, in choosing the subject they study. And this is called usually A-levels for the general students and then T-levels for VAT, but we'll, we'll hear more about from Stella later on. And then finally, our guest, Ukraine, uh, as here mentioned, uh, at the moment, upper secondary is from 15 to 18. But uh, we, the decision that was taken in 2018 from 2027, there will be an extra year. And they're now discussing how they can use this extra year. Probably it, it, the best use is to use it to give more choice to students, because at the moment, as you mentioned, uh, students cannot choose any subjects in Ukraine. So compared to the previous levels of education, upper secondary provides students with more options and with different pathways. But why is that so? It's mainly because upper secondary has to fulfill different roles. Uh, and we identify three main roles, uh, both in the paper and the spotlight. First of all, it has to accommodate a wide range of student interests, aspirations, preferences, and learning levels. This is because in upper secondary, students are older, so they start to develop their own preferences, and it's harder to keep them engaged and motivated to stay in education. So it's really important to accommodate to different needs to ensure that they complete as well. The second role is uh, to help students uh, narrow down their, their areas of interest and also to develop deep skills and knowledge because this is the last stage in education uh, and we need to prepare them to enter tertiary uh, options or also the labor market. And finally, the third role is to keep students uh, with relevant, specialized and transversal skills because once again, this is the last chance we have uh, to provide students with strong foundations before they enter adult life. And it's important to provide them with these foundations also to be able to access to lifelong uh, learning. So um, to fulfill all these roles, systems uh, use different strategies, uh, usually um, to provide different options. The first strategy, uh, it's to provide choice across programs. Not all, pro not all countries provide programs, but the majority do. Uh, and usually simply to divide students in general and vocational programs. Um, and of course, countries like Austria and Germany with strong and developed uh, vocational systems, they provide many options, especially in that. But then students can also choose subjects. Sometimes they can choose one or two, or in the case of England, they can choose all the subjects they study. Um, and of course, countries can provide both some choice across programs and some choice within programs, but usually those that focus on providing choice across programs um, provide a very limited amount of subject choice and of course, vice versa. So using uh, these two approaches to provide options in upper secondary, we mapped all the upper secondary OECD systems and we came up with three categories of designing upper secondary education. So on one axis, we have the choice across programs and on the other one, we have choice uh, within programs. And the first category are the structured systems like Austria and Germany, as already mentioned, they provide lots of options, uh, lots of programs, but then they have offer very limited choice in terms of subjects. So as you mentioned, Ukraine falls uh, very close to this category as students have uh, choices in terms of programs and specializations. But at the moment, they have to study many subjects and they have no um, 
no choice uh, of the subject they study. The second category on the other side of the spectrum are the personalized systems, like for example, New Zealand and the United States. In these systems, all students are uh, in one program. Sometimes they're even called uh, comprehensive systems, but then they can choose all the subjects they study. And so England, and here again, I'm referring to the post-16 phase is falling uh, very close to this category. They do provide two, uh, two programs, but then um, students are free to choose all the subjects they study at the moment. And finally, the third category is the intermediate system where the majority of OECD systems fall in. Uh, and these countries usually provide some choice in terms of programs, but also a bit of choice uh, in terms of subjects. And of course, also Sweden and France fall into this category. We'll hear more about them from our speakers later on. So at the beginning of the presentation, I said upper secondary needs to fulfill different roles. For sure, it has to provide choice. We said it's important to keep students motivated, engaged, so that they can they complete. But at the same time, it's really important that students in upper secondary develop specialized skills and they they narrow down their interests because we need to prepare them to access tertiary content and also uh, enter the labor market. But also because upper secondary is the last stage of education, we also need to ensure coherence and uh, that the students develop the strong foundation they need for lifelong learning. So now, just to conclude, we can put together the different categories that we identified in, in, as upper secondary designs with these three principles that all countries should be able to ensure in, in a correct upper secondary design. But we also notice that depending on the category, countries tend to focus on one of these three key elements, and then, of course, the other two are at risk. But let me explain. So in terms of choice, for example, we notice that personalized systems, like, for example, England, they tend to focus on choice. They provide a lot of choice in terms of subjects. Students have more freedom. They probably feel very engaged, and they tend to complete. But then coherence is at risk, and especially in the case of England, um, students are left with high stakes decisions because depending on the subject they decided to study at the upper secondary level, they might be closing doors for the future in tertiary education, but also in the labor market. So it's really important for the systems to provide a good career guidance, but also to ensure that all students have the chance to develop fundamental skills. And we'll hear more about the new advanced breach standards that aim exactly um, at ensuring coherence, more coherence in the system. And then um, in terms of coherence, structure systems tend to focus more uh, on, on this. They, they, they still provide choice in terms of programs, but because the programs are structured, they don't allow for subject choice. And even intermediate systems tend to focus more on coherence rather than on choice most of the times. So this is the case for Ukraine, Sweden, and France. Um, in this case, choice is at risk, and so also student engagement and completion. And it's really important that these countries uh, ensure a good balance between the compulsory subjects, but also give some choice and opportunity to specialize. And finally, just to conclude, all up upper secondary systems provide uh, some specialization. But uh, going back to the choice and coherence, usually countries like England that focus more on choice and on depth, they uh, might be lacking some breath and they might not be able to ensure that all students develop um, strong foundations. And for countries that focus on coherence, so structured and intermediate systems, they might limit the ability to adapt to the labor market needs, especially because they're changing faster nowadays. So for the first group, it's really important to ensure a broad base uh, is developed at the upper secondary level. And for the second group, it's really important to ensure progressive specialization so that students can try out different subjects, maybe at the beginning uh, of upper secondary, and then while they they go through upper secondary, they can narrow down and specialize more, as here already mentioned. We'll hear a very interesting example from France with a new BAC that is exactly doing this. And we'll hear more also about Sweden and um, the challenges they're facing to engage students um, uh, who are struggling in, in education. But yeah, the floor is back to you, Sasha, and I'm very excited to hear from our speakers.
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Camilla. Uh, I think it's really fascinating uh, what you presented, you know, I especially, you know, the, the wide variety in terms of different how educa different education systems are, 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 are formed. Uh, and also, you know, really that you brought out the, this, this, this kind of tension between the need to offer students choice, but also to help them specialize but also to keep them motivated. You know, I mean, uh, upper secondary education just isn't, isn't just about helping your future career path. It's also about uh, your social emotional development and, and you know, uh, helping you develop those social emotional skills that you need for the rest of your life. And I think this has a, an important role to play there. And, 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 and I think this also raises something else, you know, that, you know, the title of our webinar is The Art of, of uh, Choice, Balancing Choice. And, and so, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's one kind of question for you as we go along is that, you know, is this an art? Is this a science? And, and maybe one thing that I've taken away from your presentation is that there really is no one size fits all approach, right? I mean, it's, they're very highly country dependent and those have to do with the needs of those countries. So maybe we can come back to that uh, throughout the discussion, but, uh, but I do want to open things up to our panel now, uh, really eager to hear what they have to say. Um, and so I think uh, maybe we can start out with this question, uh, looking at the case of Ukraine, you know, Eeyore presented some of the, the changes that uh, Ukraine is going through. Um, and maybe you can talk us through the parallels in your own system in terms of implementing reforms. Um, talk us uh, uh, through, you know, what kind of the advantages have been for you, what those reforms look like, and also some of the challenges that you face. So Frischoff, why don't we start with you? Uh, you can uh, talk us through uh, the case of your country. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentations. And uh, thank you, Eor, for your presentation of what's going on in your educational system. Um, uh, from a Swedish experience of, of uh, choice for students, we see that choice is very important. Uh, choice makes uh, students motivated. Uh, I mean, if you can have an um, can choose from a variety of subjects and, and programs, then you much maybe more motivated to go to school and being motivated to go to school, it's, that's very important. But on the other hand, uh, when, when open, opening up for many choices, you might end up in a situation where school differentiate their educational offer. And then all schools need to have students. So they might, end up in competing with each other for students. And that's a good thing in one way. The opposite would be very bad because it's important that uh, schools try to attract students. But then you might have a situation where if there is a big freedom for schools, what they will offer in order to attract students. Then you might have a situation where, let's say you have two schools offering um, general education, natural science program, and one school says, okay, you can take away some mathematics and, and biology, and we have uh, forensic science instead. And that it's, attracts students, and the other school, they need to compete with the first school, and they have to find something else that is more attractive. And then you will have to balance what's attractive for the students in the short run, what's fun when you make your decision of choice? And what do you have use for in the long run? And that's the same thing with VET. It's important to give VET students options to have an impact on their future working life, but they, the choice must be related to the need of the labor market. So it's a balance. Choice is very important, but then how to manage competitions between schools when they want to attract students? what should be the educational offer that's that's um, we have seen that from time to time in sweden where the balance when it comes to competition for students might have a bad impact on what's really offered so just one thing to keep in mind thank you Thanks, Frichov. I, I'm curious, uh, you know, talking about this kind of uh, moving to a kind of market competition kind of model for schools, you know, what do you see as being the risk also for those fundamental subjects, those core subjects that need to be taught? Because, of course, if you're competing for students to have the, the kind of AI, everything becomes a course about AI or something, then what happens to those, those, those fundamental courses that still need to be taught, but that, you know, perhaps aren't so attractive for students? Well, um, all... All uh, upper secondary national programs, they have a, a common core of subjects that can't be taken away. So it's decided nationally 
what should be offered, the core subject, like Swedish, English, mathematics, and so on. And, and the core subjects are the same for that and for general education. It's the level of how much you study it, that varies. But then you have um, different kind of specializations, and the, these specializations are also nationally decided. But a part of upper secondary education could be decided locally. And there you have the option for the local schools or the local authorities to decide on what to, what kind of options should be for students. But looking back in Swedish educational history, there was a broader, wider space for the local authorities to make decisions. And in, in some parts, in some situation, it tended to be more focus on attracting students with what could be more described as fun than useful in the long run. But I mean, everyone tries to give students something that's important and useful. But what I'm saying is you need to balance uh, this, um, what's attractive for students in the short run, because that's very important, but also help the students to take a look on what they will have used for in the long run. That's that's all I'm saying. Wonderful, thanks so much. Uh, Amelie, I wonder if there are some parallels um, in the situation of France. I know France has just gone through some major reforms to the back, the baccalaureate uh, in terms of, uh, you know, really entirely changing these streams of uh, literature, science and e economics. Um, and so what does that look like for the country? I mean, what has been your experience since you've implemented that reform in 2022? Um, what does it look like for teachers? What does it look like for students? Maybe you can walk us through those things. Well, thank you, Sasha, and thank you all uh, the OECD for the invitation. I'm very glad to be there and to hear uh, everything. Is, it's very interesting to be there. Um, first, just really briefly uh, say to you the organization in France of the new baccalaureate. Before, five years ago, pupil has three choices, scientific stream, economic stream, and literary stream. Now, since the reform, every pupil can choose between 13 specialty uh, during the year 12 and two during the year 13. So there is a gradual sp specialization. Um, the advantage of the reform, I, I go uh, in the same way that um, to my uh, colleague from Sweden, the first advantage is that we observed that the, the pupils are more committed because they choose themselves what they are uh, going to study. It's the, really the first advantage. They're really more concerned. The, the second advantage is that it breaks out the system that leads to a ranking the three streams the pupils can choose. I, I saw in the chat speaking about mathematics. There was there's this perception in France that the scientific stream was more variable than the other two. Now, with the new baccalaureate, there is no longer any ranking between uh, classes because every pupil uh, chooses his own uh, three disciplines. And the, the third advantage is that as there is this gradual specialization between year 12 and year 13, the pupils get time to go further into the disciplines and they, it helps them to build their project for orientation further. But you're right, and the Sweden spoke about that too, there are some risks we have to be vigilant about. First, the first risk is um, to make an informed choice. The pupil and his family needs a big support to be able to choose the good um, specialities in coherence with uh, what you want to do further. So it requires training teachers, school leaders, training school leaders too, so that they can provide the support, a uh, very good support. The other risk is um, that giving choice is a good flexibility, but need that flexibility uh, uh, is in every part of the country because people now uh, can choose what they want so they must they must uh, not be constrained by the capacity of the system to implement everywhere the specialities when it's not possible to give everywhere choice of all the specialities we have set down uh, some other solutions for example online courses 
uh, or pupil can go in another nearby higher school that offer the, the specific uh, teaching it shows. For example, there is no the specialty arts everywhere in France, uh, theater, some specific specialty on uh, performing art or uh, biology, ecology, for example, is only on, in agricultural lycée. So we have to compose with this. And then just to, to perhaps because you asked this, um, Sasha, my main advice is to our Ukrainian colleague will be first build a reform which limit the transition period. This transition period creates uncertainty. Pa families, pupils don't know if it's too if it's too long. So it's it's much limit this transition period. And the other um, advice is very common, but I have to say it because it's really important: is to communicate openly with all actors, pupils, families, teachers, school leaders, unions. And also very important, higher education institution, because they need to understand and appreciate the new profiles of the pupils arriving in the education institution. This coherence is really very important. Voilà. It's okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Adeline. Uh, no, that's thank you for that very uh, specific and concrete advice to Ukraine. Uh, I have one quick question. You introduced a very important uh, point, which is um, the how do parents and students choose when they have so much uh, on offer? I mean, how do they choose between institutions? What are some of the tools um, that we can give them? Does technology play a role? You know, how does one judge uh, what what institution is going to be better for me than another? I could uh, give you the, the link we have we have built with our uh, national institution that helps to um, um, support the, the children in their orientation and their, their, their choice. We built um, a system called Future, I choose my future, uh, that uh, put in linked all the, the choice they can do uh, with the higher uh, education choice they can make. So for every uh, com uh, combined co uh, combo combo of specialties leads or not uh, to some higher studies. For example, if you choose um, physical and math or um, biology and math, it's it can be better to go uh, for medicines, but uh, it would be interesting to uh, to have chosen engineering and math. And finally, it would be good to go to medicine too, but a little bit more. So that for every kind of choose uh, of higher education, there is some path uh, uh, show, showed to the to the to the pupils. That sounds wonderful. Please do share it in the chat. I think that would sure. be very interesting for. Um, everyone who's joined us. And, and again, welcome to everyone who's joined us. We have hundreds of people from around the world. Uh, many, many different countries uh, have joined us now. Um, Stella, maybe I'll turn to you next. You know, uh, Camilla showed us this graph at the beginning that showed that uh, students in the UK have uh, his, had historically had much more choice um, than their counterparts in many other countries. But I understand that that is changing now um, and that the UK has introduced uh, compulsory math and English um, up to the age of 18 uh, as part of the new advanced British standard. So maybe you can walk us through that a little bit and talk us through uh, the motivation for that and what do you think about the implications of that change? So the uh, uh, advanced British standard is something that we are proposing at the moment and we are consulting on. We're expecting it to take at least 10 years to implement, so this will be available for students from 2033 at the earliest because that we're suggesting a lot of changes to the current system so it will take time for us to implement so we're not quite there yet um but the most but the motivation um for moving from a lot of choice um a, as you say at the moment we have for, for kids at 16 we have a levels or t levels or b techs and all sorts of um other qualifications they can choose from and they can put them together in all sorts of different combinations. And while for many students that choice is great, and um, as one of our colleagues mentioned a moment ago, choice is really key to motivation and um, 
and ensuring that these students remain engaged up to the age of 18 and they want to come to college. We've also found that a lot of this choice means that they're not actually then able to move on to where they want to go to. So perhaps they find they can't do the university course they want or they can't get the job they want or the apprenticeship that they want because the combination of courses hasn't necessarily given them the right knowledge and skills that they need um, to move on. So we are looking to kind of to streamline these thousands of qualifications that we have available. We've been doing that over the last couple of years anyway. We've started this process. But instead of students having this huge variety, we're going to give them one list of subjects to choose from so they can still do more academic subjects like A-levels and they can still do more technical vocational subjects, a bit like T-levels or BTECs, and they can still have some combinations, but it, it, the choice won't be quite so confusing for them. And uh, we will make sure that all of the subjects and all of the courses available are really high quality so that when they leave, they're able to, to progress on to where they want to go to. So that's the overall aim, really, to make sure that everything that students study is high quality and everything supports them to move on to where they want to go to and that they it is a much more simplified, streamlined system to support that decision making. So they understand the implications of the choices and the subjects they're making on what that will mean for their career prospects and things like that when they leave college. So that that's what's behind the move really so we want to maintain some choice we want to maintain some flexibility but but sort of really support students to make the right decisions there have been lots of conversations in the chat about maths and english and you mentioned it um, as well and again we've been looking at all the international evidence someone said in the chat you know lots of other countries offer this and it isn't something that has been compulsory in england but having looked at all the international evidence and the importance of sort of key maths literacy uh, skills as part of our proposal, students will have to study some form of maths and English up to the age of 18, which they don't have to now. Wonderful, thanks so much, Stella. <laughs> Fritjof, let, let me come back to you now and uh, let's talk about uh, Sweden's experience. Um, I know that to get into some vocational programs or into the general track, uh, there are entry requirements. Um, but I, what I understand is that in the case of Sweden, you know, some students are, are, are falling through the cracks. They're, they're you know, they're, they're not able to meet those entry requirements. Uh, and that ultimately leads to some of them not completing uh, upper secondary education. So uh, talk, talk us through that in the context of uh, this, this, this kind of uh, scenario. Um, is it a question of too many choices, too few choices, or is it about the pathway that uh, young people are being given uh, into those tracks? Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, leaving a compulsory school, uh, it's, it's a big step for everyone. Leaving compulsory into something that is optional, uh, upper secondary education, it's, it's, it's an important step in a, in a young student's life. It's like a rite de passage. And it's the first step to adulthood. And one of the most important things is you have a choice. You can have an impact on your future working life. Um, and and that's, that's important for everyone. Uh, and in Sweden, we do have and try requirements for starting uh, our programs in upper secondary level. Um, and you need to have um, completed compulsory school in order to manage to get through these uh, national programs. And as mentioned in, in the OECD report, you, OECD says that some countries have both uh, more academically oriented VET and more practically oriented VET. And I would say that in Sweden, VET is rather academically oriented. And that means to be able to get through this Swedish VET, you have to have done your Swedish, English and mathematics in, in compulsory school. So if you don't meet these entry requirements, you don't have so much choice. You go on with um, like what you have failed in in compulsory school in order to later on meet the entry requirements. But this means that you start with all the other students from compulsory school, they make their choice. Then you will keep on working with what these subjects where you have failed. And that can be not so motivating. And, and for some of the students, they find it really hard even to, to, to finalize and get into the uh, national program. So what we are looking in right now, if it's, would it be possible to 
not only have this rather academically oriented vet uh, with some more practically oriented vet. So when you leave compulsory school, if you have had problems with, let's say, Swedish, English and some mathematics, then you maybe could have some kind of choice and start a more practically oriented vet, get a new fresh start with new subjects where you don't have the experience of failing. And then we think you might be a little bit more motivated. And if you get motivated, you will maybe hopefully have like a positive uh, upwards uh, spiral instead of going downwards. And that could, if we organize this uh, well, you will have some Swedish, English and mathematics later on when you have, let's say, uh, find your way into that and had your fresh start. There are no decisions on this. We're working on this uh, right now. And it's, um, um, we do feel for these students that they should have some kind of choice and some kind of fresh start. But we have to balance what you need to know with what kind of general subjects you, re you really have to have with you when you go out in the labor market. There are no, wor no employers who don't need workers with Swedish, English and some mathematics, but we have to find the right balance. And students, they have different skills, different uh, uh, ways of learning. So we have to find for some students uh, new ways of finding um, a fresh start and get into that and get back on up and, <laughs> and, and get motivated. So um, is that understandable? Absolutely. Thank you. No, that was very clear. And I think, you know, you raise a, a very important point uh, that we bears further discussion. And I wonder if Stella, I can I can turn to you for this. You know, um, Frischoff is, you know, really points out that there's uh, no such thing as the archetypal student. There are many types of students with many different uh, capacities and abilities. And so how are you thinking that through in terms of the, the, the British changes? Um, you know, how will you support disadvantaged students, students from all walks of life um, to find, uh, you know, the right path for them through these changes that you're looking to implement? So we're, we are um, looking at a variety of different ways that um, a student might move on to the advanced British standard. So if they're not quite ready to start the advanced British standard, which we describe as being at level three. So exams that students take when they're 16, generally GCSEs, they are level two. And then 16 to 19, the programmes that students take generally are level three. But if a student has finished their GCSEs, uh, but perhaps they're not quite ready to start a level three qualification. We are looking at designing a, a one year, one, maybe two year level two advanced British standard. So this would allow a student to do level two uh, subjects that will prepare them and get them ready to move on to a level three ABS. So if they wanted to, in if they wanted to do sciences, perhaps as part of their ABS largely, um, they could do some level two sciences and they would also do maths and some more maths and English to prepare them to move on. So they could do that. For students who perhaps won't ever be able to do level three, they can just do a level two ABS. So we're thinking about a two year ABS, which is more occupationally focused for those students who want to move straight into work at 18. And they would still have more teaching time. They would still do English and maths. So, the, so some of the key parts of the ABS they would still have all those benefits, but they would be doing more, yeah, more occupational courses. So we would look at what we what's good in the current system. So maybe look at some of the bits of T levels and put them into sort of a level two program for those students to move straight um, into work. Um, as well, in terms of uh, making sure that we're supporting diverse um, uh, disadvantaged students, lots of evidence suggests that it's the sort of lack of maths and English, which really hinders disadvantaged students being able to move on. So making maths and English compulsory as part of the ABS is in response to that. Also, um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds also find it more difficult to do in a lot of independent study. And at the moment, I think England has one of the highest rates of independent study versus time in front of the teacher. So I think a lot of you, your students will have a lot more time in the classroom in front of a teacher than our students have. 
16 to 19. So the advanced British standards is also looking to redress that balance. So students will have more time in the classroom. They'll be expected to do less at home. So for disadvantaged students who perhaps don't have the right environment at home, don't have the right computers or whatever tech they need at home to be able to study at home, that more time in college will, will help to support them. So yeah, we're looking at different pathways into the ABS, different levels of ABS to support different students who are have different capabilities, and then some of the practical things we can do to support those students too. Thanks so much. Yes, and of, of course, the, the technology at home is only part of this story, but it's also the, the, the home environment and the support from family and those kind of things are important as well. Just curious, are there any other countries that you've looked to for kind of inspiration or, you know, models that you think can be somewhat applied to uh, the British case when you were when you as you're working on this? I mean, definitely. So sort of lots of the lots of the people represented on this on this panel. So we've definitely been looking at countries in the Netherlands. We've looked at sort of France, the US, for examples of things like how much teaching time their students receive, what their results look like. We've obviously looked at lots of OECD research in terms of breadth. So one of the things that the ABS will do will increase the number of, so what it's a bit of a slight contradiction. So while we're saying we're going to reduce choice and simplify things, we're also going to be, be asking students to do an average of five subjects instead of three, which is what they do now. And so we have looked at um, lots of research the OECD has done that shows that lots of countries do many more subjects than we do and some of the benefits that that, that brings to those students. So those key elements of the ABS, so yeah, more teaching time, a broader curriculum, um, more time in front of a teacher, those things we've definitely looked at lots of international evidence to inform what we're proposing. Wonderful, thanks. Um, Adeline, uh, I, I wonder if I can come back to you. Uh, we've had a question from the audience that I think speaks to what you were saying quite a bit. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that there's a, a kind of a new role for teachers within this new system. And obviously there, there is a, or there can be a rather large implication for teachers in terms when we when we do these large uh, changes in terms of curriculum, in terms of choice. Um, what are some of the ways that, that France is supporting teachers to kind of navigate this new uh, environment and to, to support students uh, as you implement these changes? Thank you for the question. First of all, I would just, I would like, I would like just to come back to one subject is the consequences on pupils. We both say that uh, giving choice is a source of more enga engagement. Uh, pupils are more uh, committed, but there is one thing very uh, difficult to assume uh, that needs change the, for teachers is that um, with more choice, you see that there is um, the end of class group because uh, children are sometimes together, it's 50% of the year, but sometimes they're not together. So th there is not this uh, group class like before. Um, for that, we ask teachers to become resource teacher for each group because as you, you say now, a teacher needs to have um, hours with resource teacher to build brick by brick their uh, orient orientation. So we preserve 54 hours during uh, each year, specifically dedicated to helping uh, pupils building their orientation choice. And for this, uh, these uh, teachers need special um, time of uh, classes for them specifically so that they can uh, support the pupils uh, correctly. The, and there, there are also uh, another thing that can help. It's begin before, uh, since the lower secondary education, pupils get the chance now to discover a large, large rank of profession and training pathway. The aim is that they can know and speak about 50 different professions. Whereas now, uh, a pupil in a lower secondary education is just able to speak about 10 professions. So we have uh, the ambition to let them know a larger um, uh, rank of profession so that they can make a choice, um, better choice. 
so that they can go uh, to visit some uh, firm, they can have some uh, workers coming in the lower secondary school to speak to them about the, their, the reality of the work. This is, the, this, is, this, this, is this link, uh, this better link between school and labor market that is also um, um, a central issue to be able to have the territorial equity between the, the choice they can make children. The choice can't not just uh, be based on what we have uh, a familial back background. So we have to be, be, bring this too. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, yes, in, in fact, I know uh, that France is hosting the, the next World Skills Competition in September in, in Lyon, which is a, a really a perfect way to inspire and, and educate uh, many people, including myself, about uh, you know all the different occupations out there and all the amazing things that people are doing with vocational training. Um, so uh, yes, I encourage everyone also to, to check that out and to attend if you can. Um, let me ask now a question. I'm not sure who this is for. Maybe Friedhoff, you could start, but uh, it's really for anyone. What is the role of interdisciplinary subjects in supporting school choice? So, uh, you know, subjects that cross boundaries um, from uh, between different topics. Um, has, did, do you have any experience of that in terms of how it supports uh, student choice, but also obviously giving students a chance to develop system thinking and, and other things as well? <laughs> oh, that was a difficult question. Sorry, I know. Um, it's from the audience. Blame the audience. <laughs> Oh no, all questions are relevant, but um, and interdisciplinary subjects. Um, I, I would hand over that, that question to someone else in the panel. I, I had okay. to think about it because it was difficult. Thanks for your job. Any of the other panelists, uh, do you have any reflections on this? Well, I'm not sure what is picking about. I, as I am head of the vocational education training, it's something really relevant in uh, vocational education training. Sometimes math and professional training can work together to bring um, a different way to see the discipline be, uh, before because they work together. But in the general programs, I'm not sure it's very common. It's perhaps an answer in, <laughs> to sure. say it's common in France, but I don't know what exactly you are thinking about in general program by interdisciplinarity. Well, I invite the, the audience members who have that question to, to come back to us and, and post. Yeah, uh, but you. you and many others have, have mentioned math, and I know Stella, Stella picked up on this. Many people are, are asking about, you know, what the role of math is in, in today's world. And, and, you know, that is it, is it really, is it, should we put it on the pedestal above many other competencies or does it belong, does it belong on, on equal footing? Uh, and so, you know, the, the question really is there, you know, do, do we, do we give special, you know, uh, a special place for maths as a kind of key, 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 key skill for, for the labor market? Um, and is that changing with the things like artificial intelligence? So uh, I don't know, Adeline, if you have any reflections on the importance of maths uh, in, in your own, uh, the changes that France is going through. Um, yes. Thank you, Sasha. I've, I've seen the chat, someone quoted the, the poor results of France. Uh, and PISA, so yes, we are very concerned uh, in this, uh, specifically, specifically math, but uh, also uh, literary, French literary. Um, this is um, one point we adjusted, we have adjusted to the reform of baccalaureate just, uh, 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 just two years ago, because at the beginning, um, in the common curriculum, there were no mathematics um, on uh, year 12, but uh, with the PISA results, but also because uh, we think it was really important, we adjust this and then we reinforce the place of mathematics in the common curriculum. Uh, we are working on, on um, a specific common uh, test of math at the end of the year 12. But furthermore, uh, this beginning since the lower secondary school, we choose to reinforce math also since the beginning, because we think about this uh, little, these pupils with a risk of low achievement in math. So we choose to have more, uh, more hours in math since uh, the lower education. And furthermore, and two hands for, for the pupils who have, have major difficulties, 
the ones that have major difficulties and that have achieved the lower secondary education with very worrying results. We will soon, since um, September, we will soon experiment in what we call preparatory classes to higher education system. It will last one year and these pupils uh, will benefit of classes different. It will be based on a um, project-based pedagogical approach, based on projects. And the goal is to build their self-confidence and to raise their level in math and literary, literary so that they can be uh, well prepared to enter in uh, year 11. Thanks so much, Adeline. Uh, I know we're almost out of time and I do want to give Eeyore the last word. Um, we've had a very rich and interesting discussion today. Eeyore, uh, do you have any reflections on what this means for you and have you what have you taken away from today's conversation? Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for the insights uh, I, I, I've had today. It, it was valuable so much. I just want to mention maybe three of, of, of the main ideas, which is uh, very interesting for, for Ukraine. First of, of all, it's uh, this idea of competition of schools. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we are trying to design the efficient network of both academic lyceums and a vet institution. And it is it is very important to, to take into account this idea of not uh, make them as a competitional um, sense. I, I mean, in a bad way, in a bad sense. Secondly, uh, thank you so much for the idea for limit the transition period. Uh, because um, we want, uh, as I've said, the reform uh, in upper secondary will start in 2027, but we want to have a piloting uh, in advance of that period, two years before, and it's very important to my mind uh, not to, to have this um, very long period of transition here. And the third one, of course, the communication is the key, one of the keys uh, to success. And I strongly believe that involving parents, higher educational institutions, and all relevant participants of educational process is uh, of high importance here. So yeah, thank you for that. Thanks so much, Ior. Well, I think we're just about out of time. There's many, many questions we didn't get to. But I want to extend a huge thanks to, to, to you, Eeyore, to all of our panelists who joined us today, and to all of uh, the hundreds of people who joined us online. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We have some really good ones about financing, about other things. But I think those will have to be questions for uh, another webinar. So I encourage all of you to uh, read the publication that we've mentioned, uh, which I believe the link has been shared in the chat. Um, you know, follow the development of all these educational changes from our panelists. And of course, uh, tune in for the next webinar with us at the OECD. So thanks again to everyone and have a good day.